After a year and a half of waiting, today is finally the day that we begin assembly of our 1500 horsepower big block Chevy that's going to propel this ugly lump of sheet metal deep into the eight second zone in the quarter mile. Now, I do realize that an eight second pass is a pretty ambitious goal, especially considering the ugly truck does weigh over 5,000 pounds. But the solution is very simple. We just need a whole lot of power, a little bit of luck, and some traction to go along with it. Now, the engine family that we're working with is the Gen 7 Big Block Chevy. This one is a stock 8.1 liter straight out of the junkyard. And off to the side, we have attached an 80 millimeter turbo. Now, to reach our goals, we are going to be upgrading the turbo ever so slightly, and we just need a much stronger engine to kind of hold together. So the answer is a Gen 7 Big Block made out of aftermarket parts. It's going to produce 535 cubic inches, or just under 8.8 .8 liters. And before we begin assembly on this, we just got to do a little bit of cleanup work, and then we can put it together. So these little guys that we're putting in right now, these are piston oil squirters. Um, basically what they do is they take pressurized oil, they shoot it to the bottom of the piston to help cool it off. Um, if we forgot these, we wouldn't just have more pistons, we would have no oil pressure. So, good thing we put them in. And I always air check them afterwards just to make sure that air passes through. In real time, it's actually been about two weeks since I started this engine build project and I initially hit the pause button because when I dropped the crankshaft in and I went to check the main bearing clearance using plastic gauge, well, I was getting some numbers that didn't make a whole lot of sense and I just did not feel comfortable bolting the engine together until I knew exactly what my main bearing clearance was, which basically meant I had two choices, either pay somebody else to do it or buy the tools and do it myself, which is of course the option that I chose. 
Now, it's probably a bit of an insult to call these just tools. They're more like a precision instrument, but I picked up a dial bore gauge and I picked up an outside micrometer. And this will let me measure down to the thousandths, sorry, ten thousandths of an inch exactly what my oil clearance is. So basically what we're gonna do is we use the micrometer to measure the journal here. Then we'll use that to zero out our dial bore gauge and we'll use that to measure how much bigger the opening is for the main bearing journal in the block. And that's gonna tell us our oil clearance, um, which is a very, very important and very, very precise measurement that we need to know. And apparently plastic gauge is not as accurate as it should be because the numbers that I was getting with plastic gauge were about a thousandths of an inch off, which, you know, a thousandths doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when it comes to bearing clearance, a thousandths too small can make or break your entire build. So I've actually already bolted the first main bearing cap in place. I checked this one. This is within spec, so real quick, I'm just gonna check the remaining ones. Um, I'm gonna obviously verify that the main bearing journals are all the same. Um, we'll check every single clearance, then we'll get the crankshaft back in the block and continue on with our 1500 horse big block build. Now I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. I actually had to watch a YouTube video to figure out how to read this thing because it's a bit complicated if you've never done it before, but I guess once you figure it out, it's not bad. Eight, so that's 2.748, and then you have to go up here, and then add seven, 2.7487. All right, so this now accurately represents the exact size of the crank journal. Now we are ever so carefully going to bolt this thing or attach this thing to the vise. Then we need to zero out our dial bore gauge. Now this is an extremely, extremely precise instrument, but it's also kind of difficult to do this the way I'm doing it. But Basically, that's the size there, and I get to zero it out. Okay, about two tenths off. And I am there. Now all I've got to do is go in here and measure the diameter of this, and that'll tell me my clearance. Well, that is 0 0.00027 of an inch. So we got the crankshaft permanently installed and I feel a lot better now knowing exactly where my bearing clearances are set. Um, to be perfectly honest with you guys, Hank, the guy who did my machine work actually told me where they were and uh, once you know it, they turned out to be exactly uh, where Hank said. So Hank, um, sorry for putting up with me, but I appreciate you, I honestly do. Um, I could have just closed my eyes and thrown the crankshaft in and we would have been in exactly the same spot and I could have saved a couple hundred bucks five or six hundred bucks in tools but um i don't know it's like that i'm apparently really really ocd uh, i guess that's what it comes down to but uh we, we won't get into that anyway uh the crankshaft is in it's torque to spec i'm really happy with how things are coming um, i am going to check the uh, rod bearing clearance just to double check but um you know i'm sure they're going to be exactly where they need to be as well so 
Um, it's like a mazillion, uh, that's not even a number, a gazillion, million. It's a lot of degrees in the shop here. Um, so I'm gonna call it a night and I'll see you guys in the morning. So I've already got my rod bearing installed and the bolts torqued and the dial bore gauge set up. Uh, Manly recommends between two and three thousandths of an inch of oil clearance. So let's we'll see what we have. We are at 20, 22 ten thousandths or 2.2 thousandths of an inch, which is well within spec, so we're good to go. I will double check all of these, but um, I think they're gonna be perfect. All right, so I got a challenge for you guys. Uh, on all of my videos, I want you to count how many times I start a sentence with all right or all right, because I realize it's gotten pretty bad. But anyhow, um, we're just getting to O'Reilly's because I didn't have a piston ring expander. Um, the type of rings that we're using, they say that they require one. So uh, luckily they got one at like, I don't know, six or seven bucks. Not a bad deal at all. So back to the shop, back to work. All righty. not a woodworking channel now but I don't trust this engine stand so a little support goes a long way. The most time consuming part of this whole engine project so far has just been the measurement and the verification of all the clearances and at the end of the day it's a step I didn't necessarily have to do because everything checked out but I am constantly preaching on this channel it's like my mindset that if you are going to do something if you're going to take the time and effort to do it you should do it to the very best of your ability. Like no matter what your skill level is, always do 100 or 110%. And then the next time you do a project, continue to do that. That way you're constantly improving and constantly making something better and better and better. Now I know like you can assemble an engine in what I would call like the sloppy or the junkyard way where you just, you know, throwing parts in and it'll work. Um, but I've got a substantial amount of cash invested in this engine and I'm gonna be asking a lot of it. I mean, this is, remember, we're asking 1500 horsepower out of this stuff. And you know how that goes, we'll probably end up turning it up a little bit beyond that anyway. But now that I know exactly where all the clearances are, well, that just makes the OCD part of my brain a little bit happier. Uh, it does make a lot of data. We have everything written down on the whiteboard and I'm gonna kinda save it on this sheet I got here. This is from Power Nation TV, the company I used to work for, but it's just a handy little data sheet where you can record just about every single spec of the engine. And I'll throw that with all my paperwork on my temporary desk into a folder. And that way we'll just have it in case something comes up down the road. I'm like, crap, what did I torque the rod bearings to? Or what did I, you know, well, whatever. I have all the information saved and that makes my brain happy if nothing else. Um, assembling the rods to the piston is fairly straightforward. The wrist pins are held in with these little wire locks. Uh, they definitely take a toll on your thumbs getting those things pushed in, but uh, we got them all in. Uh, Hank went ahead and set the ring gap for me, which I did check all the ones on this side. And once again, it's all spot on. Um, I'll, by the way, I did get the driver's side of the engine assembled and I'll show you the process over here on the passenger side. Fairly straightforward once you have all the bearings checked and all the wrist pins in and the rods connected to the piston. Um, so yeah, let's carry on.
<laughs> scared the crap out of me. So we are getting a little bit ahead of ourselves by throwing the intake and cylinder heads on there, but I just couldn't help myself. I had to know what it would look like with that new Raylar aluminum intake on there and with the cylinder heads. And I am so pumped and so excited to get this thing done and on the road, on the dyno, on the racetrack and see how much more power and torque we're going to be making than we are currently. Uh, major holdup though is actually with the valve train. I ordered a really, really trick set of shaft mount rockers uh, back in June, I think, but they told me back then it's going to be like 20 to 22 weeks until those are in my hands, which uh, I don't know. I hope maybe they just were like, well, we'll tell them a long time and we'll surprise them and it'll be like, you know, only eight or 10 weeks. Doubt it, but uh, a guy can hope, right? So anyway, um, that's where we're at. The bottom end of this thing is rock solid. And I wanted to address one of the questions that I get asked quite a bit. Why did I go with a Gen 7 big block versus an LS or a traditional old school big block? Because both of those platforms are much better supported on the aftermarket than the Gen 7. Two reasons really. Number one, I like doing things a little bit different. Like if there's a common way to do something, you know, e.g. the LS, I like to do something that is not the common way. So uh, I'd say the 8.1 is definitely one of the, not the most least popular engine, if that makes sense, but the 8.1 is definitely an oddball compared to the LS. And number two, um, the concept where people are like, oh, well, you could just go get a junkyard 5.3 and put some big turbos on there and make 1500 horsepower. Uh, yeah, I guess you could probably choose that route. I know there are some really, really fast drag racers who use like legit junkyard engines, but to me, that's not a very reliable long-term plan to make horsepower. I want something where it's a little bit relaxed, meaning we don't need 80 pounds of boost to make our power number. And number two, it'll last. I don't want something that, you know, blows up three or five or seven runs in. Uh, even though the economics of that, you know, if you can buy a 5.3 for say six or 800 bucks, um, you could put quite a few of those engines together before you pay for something like this. But anyway, I want something that's relaxed. You know, I estimate this will take only, you know, 15, 20 pounds of boost to get to my power number versus, you know, like the cool comparison is between like a small two liter Honda motor. Those guys can make a legit 1500 horse as well, but they'll need like 80 pounds of boost where we only need like a quarter of that. So that's my thought process behind building this particular platform. Uh, also, I wanted to ask you a question. What color should I paint this? I have two ideas I'm going back and forth between. Number one, I thought about doing like a blacked out, low key, you know, satin black, everything, top to bottom, front to back, including all the turbo pipes and compressor cover. 
Uh, it'll be very clean and very low key. Or the other option I thought about was a little bit of old school, you know, like a Chevy orange look. Kind of like the uh, 572 crate motor. I really love how that one looks where they had, you know, an orange block, the aluminum heads and intake and then orange valve covers. And of course, I'd also do like the compressor cover and all the charge pipes orange as well, just to kind of, you know, have it look consistent. So those are my two ideas. If you've got a better one, let me know. I mean, you know, the diesel guys, for example, they do all kinds of crazy colors and I wouldn't even mind like, you know, bright red or lime green or something that's just in your face. Because with this truck, I want the outside to be really, really low key, you know, still faded and dented in the back there. But when you pop the hood, I want it to look, you know, perfect, spot on, really, really clean, nice and organized. And I'm just kind of curious on the color because I do, I do want to do something different. And I'm actually kind of leaning more towards a bright color than I am the blacked out low key look. Uh, anyway, if you guys liked this video with our big block engine build, check out another one I did last year with the 4.8 LS that's in my other Silverado. That one was like a complete opposite. That was like a bare bones budget build for boost, uh, but just totally the opposite, but a lot of the same cool things. We did. So check out that video if you don't mind. Um, thank you for watching and come back soon for more cool truck content. Little spider looks like he's about to attack me. Either that or he's protecting my truck. <laughs>